developing and architecting on AWS, and enjoy working with customers from various different industries and backgrounds. Since the cloud is an ever-changing space, it's always neat to hear about new use cases and customer stories. It is a pleasure to walk you through today uh, through some different foundational services and also some new ones in this year's awesome day. This year, we'll be walking through some fundamental concepts and key service areas to kickstart your learning journey and help you prepare to start building on AWS. In addition to that, we'll be discussing a few innovation areas you might be interested in knowing more about. This session serves as a great intro to the AWS Cloud. So if you're new to AWS or just looking to learn more, you're in the right place. Uh, first up uh, on our agenda, we're going to do an introduction to AWS. For some of those that maybe have not used AWS before or are brand new to some of the services we're going to talk about today, we'll do an introduction to AWS. We'll start to get into some of the key service areas, uh, compute, storage, databases, networking, and security. In the second half of our session, we'll actually shift our focus to some other services that enable innovation on AWS. We're going to talk about how AWS services can help you manage Internet of Things, maybe stand up a blockchain, or even control and process, let's say, satellite communications. At the end of our session, we're going to talk about next steps after this year's awesome day and what you can do to get hands-on, start building, continue learning, and also maybe even get AWS certified. So in the second half, like I said, of this session, we're going to talk about innovation on AWS, and we're going to uh, cover some different topics like Internet of Things, uh, machine learning, uh, blockchain, uh, something called AWS Ground Station for satellite communications, and then also we're going to talk about AWS Wavelength, uh, basically a new service that uh, is, is underpinned by the 5G technology and how we can use that to um, expand on applications that are possible today. And we'll talk more about these later in the second half, like I said. In this first section here, like I said, we're going to go ahead and do an introduction to AWS. For those that maybe are, like I said, new to different services um, on AWS, maybe how they work uh, within uh, Amazon Web Services, um, and then uh, also just kind of generally understanding you know, what the cloud is. So um, on that point, let's go ahead and do an introduction to the cloud, right? So um, what is the cloud and what is the, uh, the AWS cloud? So first, programmable resources. The use of IT assets as programmatic resources allows you to quickly set up and tear down infrastructure in a way that isn't possible with a traditional approach. Second, the cloud lets you build applications in very dynamic fashion. You can increase database throughput or maybe compute power, as we'll see later, with really just a few clicks. And then last, one of the biggest benefits of cloud computing is the ability to pay as you go, letting you test and leverage the system without being fully committed. You can stop using these services at any time and uh, change tactics to fit your needs. So first up here, we have trading capital expense for variable expense. Instead of investing heavily in data centers and servers before you know you're, how you're going to use them for your application, uh, having a variable expense means that you're only paying for those compute resources when you consume them instead. And by taking a cloud computing approach that offers the benefit of variable expense, companies can implement innovative solutions while saving on costs. The second one that we have is uh, benefiting from massive economies of scale. And by using cloud computing, you can achieve a lower variable cost uh, than you could even possibly get on your own. So because uh, um, use from hundreds of thousands of customers that are, that are using AWS is, is aggregated in the cloud, uh, providers like AWS can achieve higher economies of scale. And uh, that economies of scale tr uh, translates into a lower pay-as-you-go price uh, because AWS passes those cost savings along to you. Next, you can stop guessing capacity. So you no longer have to think about what your infrastructure capacity needs are going to be, let's say, a year from now. Uh, when you make a capacity decision before deploying an application, you're often going to uh, end up either sitting on an expensive idle resource uh, that's not being used, um, or maybe dealing with limited capacity if you decide to uh, set aside less resources up front. So with cloud computing, again, these types of problems go away. Uh, you can access as much or as little as you need and scale up and down as required with uh, only a few minutes notice if needed. We also have uh, increasing speed and agility. Uh, in a cloud computing environment, new IT resources are really just a click away. 
Um, so it's no longer going to take uh, weeks for developers to access resources, and instead they're available potentially within minutes. Um, this also enables another benefit. So organizations and uh, teams can also spin up a proof of concept. Uh, and if it's not working out exactly as intended, they can fail fast, so to speak, and stop using those resources right away. So as a result, organizations can have a really dramatic increase in, in their agility because the cost and time that it takes to experiment and, and also develop is, is a lot lower. You can also stop spending money on running and maintaining data centers, right? We've been kind of talking about this uh, thus far. So the cloud enables you to focus on projects that really differentiate your business, not the underlying infrastructure. And again, with cloud computing, you can focus on your own customers instead of what we call undifferentiated heavy lifting, like racking, stacking, and, and, and uh, installing and powering servers. And the last benefit that we have here is the ability to really just go global in minutes. Uh, you can easily deploy your application in, let's say, multiple regions around the world, as we'll see with our infrastructure, with really just a few clicks and uh, achieving real global scale. This means that you can provide a lower latency and a better experience for your end customers or end users at really a minimal cost. So what is the cloud? So in order to understand what the cloud is, we have to compare it to on-premises, right? We have to compare it to uh, you know, some point to understand what cloud is and what the benefits are. So first, you know, on-premises, we talked about you know, servers, maybe storage, uh, maybe databases or applications that are running on that physical equipment there. And again, if you have all of those uh, resources on-premises, you're going to typically uh, connect to those over some corporate network, right? Well, with the cloud, it doesn't operate all that differently. You're still going to have those resources and have the ability to access them, but you're going to do it in a much more flexible manner uh, over the internet, right? And we'll talk about some of the ways that we can do that as we get into networking a bit later. And so AWS offers the ability to access your servers, again, your storage, database, applications, all programmatically or over the internet as you need. You might also be familiar with some of these concepts here over on the left-hand side of the chart. So let's kind of talk about some of the core infrastructure and services before we break into some of these areas coming up. First, talking about security. You might already be familiar with firewalls, ACLs, or access control lists, um, and maybe even have network uh, you know, or, or security administrators within your team or your company. Well, we've got similar concepts in AWS. We have the concept of security groups. We've also got network ACLs, and we'll talk about networking coming up. And we've also got a service uh, called Identity and Access Management, or AWS IAM, uh, which helps you, uh, you know, provide access and uh, you know, authorization uh, to users uh, of these different resources that we're going to talk about. So you have the ability to manage that through one service. Next is networking, right? So you might be familiar with the concept of uh, you know, a router, physical device, um, maybe network pipeline, or uh, you know, basic networking concepts, uh, switches, and other types of hardware, right? Well, we have very similar concepts uh, in AWS, but again, they're gonna be through services like elastic load balancing, which gives you the ability to essentially distribute traffic amongst multiple different targets um, or instances, as we'll talk about coming up. And then we've also got the virtual private cloud, the ability to basically network and uh, control how your resources are connected to each other um, and you know, basically with a logical uh, isolated network that you define. Then when it comes to servers, right? So uh, you might be familiar with uh, you know, managing or uh, deploying or patching or uh, basically just operating with servers on premises or maybe in a co-location. Well, again, you know, we have a similar concept here and we'll talk about uh, the EC2 service, but essentially you can use an AMI or an Amazon machine image uh, to deploy uh, EC2 instances and run your workloads within AWS. AWS offers a number of different storage options depending on your requirements, whether that's network detached storage and persistent disk, maybe scratch space or, or caches, file systems to be shared between different hosts, um, and even you know, dead simple object storage for a wide variety of applications, uh, and also more than uh, 15 purpose-built databases, as we'll see uh, coming up a bit later. Um, for instance, uh, Amazon Elastic Block Store, or EBS as it's known, uh, offers easy to use high performance block storage at any scale. Uh, EFS, or uh, Amazon Elastic File System, provides a scalable Elastic Cloud Native uh, NFS file system. And um, also, we'll talk about S3 a bit later, uh, Amazon Simple Storage Service, or S3, provides object storage built to store and retrieve any amount of data from anywhere on the web. 
So I'm sure you're already familiar with many of these concepts on the left-hand side. And again, they kind of translate into different services uh, and features of services that we have within AWS. So hopefully this is kind of a good way to understand your current knowledge applies to different services that we'll talk about here. Uh, and then we'll go a little bit deeper into uh, the different AWS services coming up. So within each of these you know, key service areas we talked about, we're going to go into much more detail on compute, on storage, databases, networking, and security, as I mentioned before. But just to kind of put things together or into perspective for a moment so we can see visually, uh, let's say, an application that we are hosting. So starting off here, we have an application of, let's say, hosted on, uh, you know, on some uh, compute. right? We have EC2 uh, as the service where we can create and manage an instance uh, which we can install or you know build an application on top of that maybe serves uh, you know uh, uh, up traffic to users that are accessing that application, right? So EC2 is going to sit within our virtual private cloud, uh, and that gives us the ability to control the networking uh, and how that application is able to let's say talk to or other users or clients are able to talk to that application, right? All sitting within that networking concept of VPC. Then we also have kind of storage to consider here. We've got EBS, or Elastic Block Store, for block storage um, so that our EC2 instance can persist or save data into a location while that application is running. Another example of storage here, a little bit different, is S3, or Simple Storage Service. And again, that's where we're going to store, let's say, uh, entire objects or files um, that we can you know, send and, and retrieve from that application over HTTP. Then we've got the database side of things. right? We've got DynamoDB as an example, or we could have a relational database. Uh, but basically being able to utilize a database to, again, persist or store data in a structured format um, for our application. And finally, uh, that user being able to get to that application, um, let's say over the internet, we might need to use DNS, or we could use uh, Route 53 as a way to resolve uh, an example, um, you know, a domain that we have to our application so that users are able to access it over the internet. So that's how all of these different concepts kind of fit together. We're going to dive into each of these areas a little bit further coming up. So one question you might have is, well, how does it all work, right? Uh, you said that you know, basically you can access these services. But if I'm familiar with, let's say, accessing my database over my corporate network on premises, how would I do that with AWS? So the first thing here is AWS owns and maintains the network connected hardware, right? And that allows us to be able to provide these services, again, uh, that you can access over the internet. All you're going to need to do is provision what you're going to uh, need uh, for your application. Uh, and again, you can scale that ongoing. We'll talk about some ways to be able to do that. One simple way to get started here is actually to use the AWS Management Console. We'll talk about the three main ways to use AWS services coming up. There's also many different cloud deployment models. And uh, potentially, you might have your workloads running, again, on-premises, where we talk about uh, the traditional on-premises approach. And in that case, you might have uh, what's called, let's say, a private cloud, right? We're going to talk more today about hybrid and, uh, and you know, cloud-based approach. But in this case, maybe you have, or in the middle case with hybrid, uh, you have an application that you want for some reason to run specifically on uh, your own premises. It could be based on you know, regulation or other purposes. And you want to have other components within your organization or other applications that you're running in the cloud and connect them together, right? So you could take that hybrid approach. And then finally, uh, you can run everything within the cloud. And essentially, your, all of your applications, all your workloads are going to run uh, using services that are either cloud native um, or all running within the cloud. So that being the case, now that we talked about a few different cloud deployment models, where can we run our workloads? Where can we run our applications? Let's briefly talk about the AWS global infrastructure. As we mentioned earlier, you have the ability to go global in minutes. Uh, so let's talk about that, how that global infrastructure looks and uh, the AWS backbone. So here, uh, it may not be a surprise to anyone, but we operate uh, data centers, right? Uh, and these data centers are all online. Uh, they're not cold. We don't have any backup data centers that are not running at any given time. And the reason for that is because we want to, that to be operationally efficient and be able to pass those cost savings along to customers. So these are all online, not cold, uh, typically house thousands of servers. Um, and we actually get our equipment. They're multiple ODM sourced. Uh, which essentially is a way to make sure that those, the equipment is reliable and uh, we have fault tolerance built in uh, to our uh, data centers. Additionally, we have this concept of an availability zone, or an AZ that you might have seen. 
And this is actually a collection of one or more data centers together designed for fault isolation with uh, potentially different uh, you know, power sources and different utilities, uh, again, for that fault tolerance and uh, for fault isolation. Um, as well as uh, interconnected with other availability zones using uh, high-speed private links. AWS has also the concept of a region, a physical location around the world, which consists of two or more isolated and physically separated uh, AZs or availability zones. Uh, AWS infrastructure regions meet the highest levels of security, compliance, and data protection, and there's currently 25 regions worldwide. Here's an example of the Singapore region, which currently consists of three availability zones, uh, each with independent power, cooling, and physical security, uh, and they're all connected via redundant ultra-low latency networks. Additionally, here's a map of the AWS global infrastructure and the current regions. Um, and if you look at some of the bubbles and the numbers on the chart here, each of these circles represents a region spread throughout the globe. Uh, and within each of those circles, we have a number, and that number is the uh, number of availability zones within that region. So a couple of things to uh, think about here in terms of choosing a region. You might be thinking, well, you know, why would I want uh, you know, to choose one region over another, especially if it is potentially further away uh, from where my company is located or where my team is located? And a few things that we're going to visit a little bit later when we talk about S3 is uh, you might want to choose a region based on data governance or uh, potential um, you know, regulation uh, that affects your business. Uh, so choosing where your data resides uh, is, is really important. So that's one reason you might choose a region. Another is latency. And uh, if you think about where your end users or maybe your customers are located, you want to provide the least latency experience you possibly can for them. Uh, so what you would want to do, in, you know, let's say as an example, you have a customer um, or most of your customers are in the U.S. Um, you wouldn't want to choose uh, you know, Sao Paulo, Brazil uh, for hosting your application because there's going to be a long round trip time um, for the communication between your end users and let's say your application that would be hosted there. So you'd want to choose a region that is closer to your end users uh, so this is where you have less latency. And the last reason to think about is cost. Uh, it actually costs AWS different uh, amounts for different services in different regions throughout the world. So in some cases, if you think of storage, we'll talk about S3 coming up in a bit, but uh, choosing to have a S3 bucket in one region or another based on how much it's going to cost uh, to save your, your data there. So that's another reason why we'd want to choose one region over another. The last thing to mention here is our edge infrastructure. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this and some different capabilities with outposts, local zones, and wavelength coming up. Um, but I also want to mention uh, Amazon CloudFront, which is our, cl our content delivery network, or CDN. And this allows you to cache uh, potentially data that's sitting in an S3 bucket uh, you know, closer to your end users in various uh, what we call points of presence that are spread throughout the globe. So you may have users or you know, end users within the company or outside of the company or outside the team uh, that are located between regions. Um, so in order to you know, have better uh, late or less latency for those users uh, in those places, you can utilize a content delivery network for a better end user experience there. So when it comes to the AWS Edge infrastructure, on top of those 25 regions and the availability zones within those regions we talked about, we have additional capabilities around Edge infrastructure. One of them is AWS Outposts. And AWS Outposts is a fully managed service that extends AWS infrastructure AWS services, APIs, and tools to virtually any data center, co-location space, or on-premises facility for a consistent hybrid experience, just like we talked about before with hybrid. Local zones, uh, a new type of AWS infrastructure deployment that places AWS compute, storage, databases, and other select services closer to, let's say, large populations like large cities, uh, industries, and IT centers. Uh, where no, let's say no AWS region exists today, right? So additional capabilities that we have on top of those points of presence with CloudFront um, and the certain locations and also our regions, um, we have additional capabilities within the edge infrastructure. And finally, uh, we're actually gonna talk about this one a little bit more later, is AWS Wavelength, kind of a new uh, service for uh, the 5G technology that is emerging today. So using all these services that we talked about uh, you know, up to this point, uh, you know, how do we actually interact with these services? And I kind of hinted at one before uh, through the AWS Management Console. So really, that's the easiest way to get started if you haven't worked with AWS before. Uh, easy to use graphical interface. Uh, you basically create a new AWS account and log in, and there you are. You can access the various services that we're going to talk about today. And so that's all going to be through your browser. 
If you are in an operations or systems administration role, you may want to use the AWS Command Line Interface, or CLI. The CLI is a unified tool for managing, controlling, and also automating many AWS services through discrete commands. The CLI provides a suite of utilities that can be launched from a command program in Linux, Mac, or Windows. And then finally, our third option here is via the Software Development Kits, or SDKs, which let you access AWS services through your code or applications using a number of familiar programming languages, like Python, for instance. One thing that each of these methods has in common is that no matter which way you choose to access AWS services, you're still interacting with the AWS APIs. Next up, we have networking. And actually, at the center of networking in AWS is Amazon, Amazon Virtual Private Cloud, or Amazon VPC. And so your VPC is going to be your private network space in the AWS cloud. It's going to give you the ability to logically isolate your workloads into potentially different subnets, as we'll talk about. And it also gives you custom access controls and security settings for your resources sitting in your VPC. So VPC is going to give you complete control over things like you know, how your resources are connected to each other and networked up. Um, and we'll talk about some of the different control mechanisms coming up. So let's talk about a concept called layered network defense for your virtual private clouds. And really what you want to do here is have security, security at all layers uh, for what we call a defense in depth approach. And so we're going to go through a few of these concepts in a moment here. But if you think about the outer ring of your resources, your applications that are running, you have something called your VPC route tables. Within that, uh, you can also use subnet ACLs, or your access control list, to control that inbound and outbound traffic in and out of those, those subnets. Then uh, you actually have your EC2 uh, Elastic Network Interface security groups, uh, which again, you can control your inbound and outbound uh, traffic. And then last, uh, you've actually got host-based protection that you can utilize, um, you know, such as maybe hardened, secure, or hardened uh, EC2 instances um, or specific Amazon machine images uh, that you use to protect those instances. So if you think about it, we're using all of these layers to have a much more secure approach uh, for our workloads running within our VPC. So one example that we can go through here is actually using your subnets uh, within your VPC uh, to divide up, let's say, multiple different workloads um, and multiple different tiers within an application. So this is a pretty common practice is actually uh, using subnets uh, to, again, you know, divide up your network into uh, different uh, segments or, or partitions of your VPC. And you've actually got control over the IP address ranges uh, within these subnets and within your VPC um, so that you can determine you know, how large a subnet, how small a subnet you're going to use. Now, a couple of things that are important to understand about subnetting, uh, this is a, a fairly common approach that you'll see in documentation um, and uh, you know, lots of different uh, you know, visuals. You'll see where you have the public subnet and the private subnet. So private subnets um, do not have a routing table entry uh, to an internet gateway. And the purpose of this is not to have any internet accessibility or no direct internet accessibility to that private subnet. So that would be a great place to put things like databases or resources that you don't want to connect uh, you know, to other clients um, or be accessible from the open internet. As we talked about with S3 and buckets before being tied to a particular region, VPCs are also within a region as well. So uh, you can have multiple VPCs or virtual private clouds within a region. You just can't have multiple, uh, you can't have a VPC spanning multiple different regions. Uh, within that region there, you can take advantage of the availability zones to increase the availability of your application. And in this example, we can see that we're utilizing uh, public and private subnets in different availability zones, maybe to increase, again, the availability of our application within that VPC. So now that we know more about subnets here, let's talk about how we can take advantage of these uh, different parts of our infrastructure or uh, our application uh, to use that defense in depth approach. Um, so using this example here, again, we talked about those access control lists and then the security groups. Uh, we can actually use both of those together, again, for that defense in depth or layered security, right? Um, so if we have, let's say, an EC2 instance that is sitting you know, within a security group that we've defined, um, that security group can basically say what uh, you know, type of traffic is allowed uh, to or from the network interface for that EC2 instance. Um, and our application developers can configure that security group as needed. Outside of that, we've got the subnets. And uh, within that subnet, we might have multiple different EC2 instances or applications that are running. Uh, and again, we choose how we want to break up our VPC into those multiple subnets. With, when it comes to the subnet there, we also have the ability to add in network ACL uh, or network ACLs or access control lists. 
And this gives us the capability to be able to allow or deny traffic in and out of those subnets themselves. So for all of the instances or uh, you know, different resources that are within that subnet, uh, we can determine what traffic is allowed in and out uh, using that network ACL. On top of that, we also have the route table. Uh, the route table is what gives us the ability to determine uh, you know, what the path is to, let's say, the internet gateway um, or other subnets within our VPC. And the, the whole idea here is that we have the ability to tweak and uh, you know, customize this as needed for our, uh, our application or for our infrastructure. Now, when it comes to actually determining how you know, traffic gets to, let's say, one instance versus another, uh, we might actually need to spread those requests over multiple different uh, applications or instances uh, within our VPC and within our subnets. And so we have a service for this called Elastic Load Balancing. Uh, we can configure uh, load balancers to basically distribute incoming application traffic amongst multiple different EC2 instances uh, or containers or other IP addresses. Uh, Elastic Load Balancing has a high availability uh, built in, but can also be used to add higher availability to your application. So it's something that you can utilize uh, you know, to make sure that your application is fault tolerant um, and always available for your end customers. It also supports health checks. So if instances uh, behind that Elastic Load Balancer uh, fail or maybe your application stops responding, uh, Elastic Load Balancer can actually determine when an instance has failed um, and we can either you know, restart or recreate uh, a new instance behind the scenes there or route that traffic or that request to another EC2 instance. And so that's how we achieve higher availability uh, you know, within, that, uh, within our application. And then finally, we also get security features uh, within Elastic Load Balancing as well. Um, we can utilize uh, you know, um, uh, TLS termination on our Elastic Load Balancer uh, to unburden our instances behind the scenes uh, with uh, TLS. So whereas Elastic Load Balancing gives us the ability to distribute that incoming uh, traffic to uh, multiple instances or applications that might be sitting behind the scenes in our subnet, Route 53 gives us the capability to do that on a global scale. So Route 53 is a highly available and scalable cloud domain name system or DNS service. So it's going to translate domain names into IP addresses that are those instances sitting in our, our subnets in our VPCs as you, as you can see here. We have the ability to purchase and manage domain names uh, such as example.com uh, and automatically configure our DNS settings for our application. It provides tools for uh, flexible, high performance, highly available architectures on AWS. And we have multiple routing options. So an example we can see here, uh, you know, we have a website, uh, www.example.com. We may have some clients or users that are coming into that website. Um, and so maybe we wanna route that traffic to one VPC in uh, you know, a region that we talked about before, let's say Northern Virginia, um, or depending on you know, where that user or that client is based, maybe they are actually in the uh, Brazil uh, region. So we wanna actually send them to a local version of our application uh, that's in Portuguese uh, in Brazil, right? So we have the capability of, um, of doing that, routing uh, using different routing options uh, to applications that might sit in different VPCs uh, in, in different geos. So let's go ahead and put it all together. Uh, in this example here, we might have a client or an end user um, that is going to uh, need to go to our application that is sitting again within our VPC. Um, so that end user would navigate to their example.com. Route 53 would be used to resolve that into a DNS address, uh, which then you know, leads us through our internet gateway to our elastic load balancer and distributes that incoming traffic to multiple EC2 instances, which then could respond back to the user, right? And we're doing this all within our VPC, um, within our uh, AWS cloud. So finally, let's go ahead and do a knowledge check for this section. So which of the following are layers of network defense for our VPCs or virtual private clouds? Go ahead and choose three. So we've got A, uh, Amazon Machine Images, AMIs, B, Network Access Control Lists, and those are for, again, the subnet level, C, security groups, and those are at the instance level. D, S3 lifecycle policies. And E, VPC route tables. So choosing three, um, Amazon machine images, those are you know, related to EC2, right? And uh, template to uh, create a new EC2 instance. Uh, S3 lifecycle policies, uh, we didn't talk too much about that, but uh, that's a way for us to be able to move between different 
uh, tiers within uh, S3. So maybe moving the uh, you know, data that we have from our S3 bucket into Glacier for archive purposes, we can do that in a more scheduled manner, um, but that does not relate to our VPCs. So here are network AC, uh, ACLs or access control lists. Again, those are controls that we can use at the subnet level, um, as well as security groups at the instance level, and also our VPC route tables uh, to determine routing within our VPC. So the first section we're going to talk about here is compute. And really, to talk about compute, the first thing that we need to address is Amazon EC2, or Elastic Compute Cloud. And what EC2 is, is resizable compute capacity. So for many different workloads that you may already be running, uh, EC2 is a great way to actually get started, whether you're migrating or creating a new application um, within the EC2 service. And it gives you complete control of your comp uh, computing resources. And we'll talk about some of the different ways uh, that we can tweak um, and you know, customize EC2 for our needs. And finally here, uh, reduce time to, uh, required to obtain and boot a new server instance. And we'll talk about how to do that with Amazon Machine Images. So you may be familiar with this concept of virtual machine, but let's kind of do kind of a quick intro. So a virtual machine versus a physical server. So if you think about a whole physical server, let's say on premises, right? Uh, you may be using 100% of that server, you may be using 10% or less, right? With virtual machines, we have the ability to kind of split up that physical server into multiple different uh, uh, virtual machines. And that's essentially what we're talking about here. So Amazon EC2 can solve some problems that are more difficult uh, uh, with an on-premises server. So we have the ability to uh, use EC2 as you know, disposable resources where we can start an EC2 instance when we need to, let's say, uh, you know, run a calculation um, or maybe start an application during our normal business hours and then shut it down when we no longer need it. And so that's kind of the idea behind virtual machine is we can achieve a much more optimal or efficient use of resources um, you know, through those virtual machines. Let's talk about some important details about EC2 and how it can help us. So EC2 provides you pay-as-you-go pricing. We talked about that before with the main benefits of cloud. Uh, and a broad selection of hardware and software. So you really have the ability to tweak and tune EC2 to fit your application's needs. First, we're gonna start off with this concept of an Amazon machine image, which is really the template um, you know, for your EC2 instance and for your application uh, that you're going to start. So your Amazon machine image can include uh, you know, your, your template for storage volumes, so which volumes that you want to attach to that new uh, compute instance, uh, launch permissions, uh, block device mappings, um, and more. Right? So think about Amazon Machine Image or your AMI as being the template uh, for that EC2 instance when it starts. Right? And uh, we can actually utilize our EC2 instance for a variety of different purposes. So our Amazon Machine Image can be the image for, let's say, an application server or uh, a web server or let's say even a database uh, that we talked about before. Um, so for a variety of different use cases, we can kind of bake that into our Amazon machine image so that as soon as we're ready for, uh, you know, to start up that application, uh, we can use a, a pre-made Amazon machine image uh, that contains everything that our instance needs uh, when we start it. And so that's really handy for, again, you know, using these resources. Um, for either you know, small bits of time instead of long running instances uh, over time. So that pay as you go pricing can be a huge benefit. So we'll use these uh, Amazon machine images to really you know, start our EC2 instance so that we know, uh, you know as, as soon as we start it, uh, it's got everything that we need for that application to run. We can run it during the normal business day, uh, let's say eight hours or so. And then if we want, let's say no one's using that web server or that application server uh, at night, let's say after 5 p.m., we can go ahead and shut down that resource and no longer uh, incur costs within EC2. And then using that Amazon machine image, we can go ahead and start that EC2 instance up again uh, the next day. So this is where we're paying more granularly, uh, pay as you go for that instance. So you can add and terminate uh, you know, instances as needed, and there's lots of capabilities um, around EC2, around scaling, creating fleets of instances, and more. And then you can also pause and resume your instances uh, utilizing EBS and, and a variety of other uh, resources within, or you know, features within the EC2 service. So main benefits to talk about EC2, so we kind of alluded to some of these before, but let's actually break them into distinct benefits. 
So first is elasticity, right? So having the ability to scale up and scale down within our application as, let's say, more demand comes in for that application. So to give you an example, let's say you're running on EC2, you're running a, uh, a web server, right? And let's say during the norm, normal course of the day, you expect around 100 users to come into that application, uh, into that web server that's running. Um, and you know, let's say around 12 o'clock is when you normally hit your peak uh, of 100 users. And then as the day goes on, uh, you, know, you hit maybe 6 p.m., 7 p.m., that number really starts to dwindle off. And now you're down to a baseline of, let's say, around 10 users um, on, in any given hour or any given minute. right? With EC2, there's various different features built in that give us the ability to scale up and scale down so that we can take advantage of that pay-as-you-go pricing that we talked about. Um, so that elasticity is really great from that standpoint. The second part of that is, well, what happens if we go above that 100% that we were anticipating? Kind of going back to that scalability that we talked about, uh, we have the ability to increase the number of instances that serve that web traffic. And we could go up to 200 or 300 or 3,000 uh, if we want, you know, concurrent users by increasing the number of resources under the hood, right? So we have that elasticity to be able to do that um, and lots of other tools and resources that come along with that within the EC2 service. The second one here is uh, control, right? We have the ability to stop and start instances uh, or pause and resume for certain supported instances as we need. And again, that has a, uh, you know, a, a price benefit for us, the ability to uh, you know, save costs when we don't need our instances uh, to be running, we can scale down. Um, but then also gives us the ability to uh, you know, size our fleet accordingly uh, for the amount of traffic. Flexibility, um, we actually have a number of different EC2 instances and uh, families we'll talk about in a moment here, but you can pick the right type of instance for the right type of job or the job that you need to get done. Uh, EC2 is integrated, so uh, we can actually have our EC2 instances sitting within that virtual private cloud, uh, so we can network them up in, in a fashion that is conducive to our application um, from our security standards, uh, you name it. Um, and then also integrated with a number of other services, things like Elastic Load Balancing. And then we also have the auto scale scaling capability uh, within EC2 as well. So it's highly integrated with other AWS services. And there's a number of other benefits to uh, EC2, including reliability, uh, security, as we mentioned before, and we'll touch more on that later. Um, inexpensive in terms of you can pick the right type of instance for uh, the job that you need to get done, whether it's a small instance or a large instance with different resources matched to the workload specifically that you have for EC2. We also have this concept of EC2 instance families, as I mentioned, and uh, naming convention. I want to give you kind of a quick introduction to that as well. So let's say you sign into the AWS Management Console, uh, you go to the EC2 service, and you want to create a brand new EC2 instance, right? You have your choice of the instance for the specific use case or need uh, of your application. So as an example, uh, if we look at the instance families uh, in this chart here, uh, we've got general purpose, compute optimized, memory optimized, storage optimized, and accelerated computing, right? And we have a number of other types of uh, EC2 instances as well. Um, but just to kind of summarize what some of these different types of instances can do for us, or you know, let's say the general purpose family, uh, that might be for something like low traffic websites and web applications, as we talked about before. Let's say your application actually needs uh, you know, higher performance, uh, or you, you have a higher performance uh, web server that you want to host on EC2. Well, in that case, you might want to go with something like a compute optimized instance. You might want to choose a C5 um, or a, a C4 uh, you know, generation uh, EC2 instance, right? So there's a number of different configurations for different types of uh, workloads that might run on EC2. And uh, one last thing just to think about here is that this also comes down to you know, scaling and, uh, and, and choosing the right uh, you know, price option for your needs. So in the case where, let's say, you really have that low traffic uh, you know, situation or low traffic website, it wouldn't make a whole lot of sense to go with a C5 or C4 instance uh, because, again, you're not going to be maxing out or utilizing the full capability of that instance. So this can also be an effective uh, you know, cost savings measure as well. So along with choosing the right EC2 instance family for that right price performance ratio for your specific application's use case, um, we have a number of different pricing options for EC2 instances. So what we've been talking about so far is on-demand instances, where you can basically say, let's say at 9.23 a.m. Uh, you know, on a Monday, you decide you want to spin up a new batch job or assign to your, you know, some uh, computation that you want to do. And towards the end of that job or the end of the day, you want to go ahead and terminate that instance. Again, you can do that. Pay as you go pricing, uh, you have the option. But on-demand instances are going to be your 100% uh, you know, normal cost uh, EC2 instance. 
On top of that, uh, if you know that you're going to need to run, let's say, a uh, web server uh, for the foreseeable future, you can opt for a reserved instance. You can commit to in either uh, one or three year term uh, to lock in some savings on those EC2 instances. Savings plans, uh, you know, similar in that case where you can actually commit to a certain amount of capacity that you're going to uh, utilize over time. And then probably the most interesting here is spot instances, is uh, basically a way to save up to 90% off those on-demand pricing or those on-demand instance pricing uh, with one caveat. Those uh, can actually receive an interruption notice um, and be terminated within uh, a two-minute warning um, uh, for that job. So this is really great for things like if you had to run uh, again, you know, scientific, uh, you know, let's say um, molecular modeling or something like that, um, and you didn't want to spend, you know, the 100% normal cost that we talked about, uh, you want to achieve some savings on that job, uh, maybe your application is tolerant of some of those uh, terminations that might happen and can go ahead and take, uh, you know, where that, that instance was processing and have another instance resume that. If your application can handle something like that, that's a great way to save on cost uh, using spot instances. And one thing that's great about all this here is a per second billing with Amazon Linux and, and Ubuntu and a per hour billing with all other operating systems. And so um, what's great about that, like I said, is on top of these different pricing plans and choosing the right instance for the job that you need to get done, uh, you get very granular billing uh, uh, as well. One other concept that I want to uh, introduce here is this concept of unmanaged versus managed services. And we're going to see this throughout uh, in a couple different services coming up. Um, in the next sections. But I want to introduce it now because we've actually got something to talk about that is a much more managed option, as we would call it, um, or fully managed option within Compute. And so just to briefly talk about this, on managed, you're really managing the scaling, the fault tolerance, and availability on your own within your application, right? And again, compared to the... And so the reason I introduced that is that uh, we're going to now shift gears a little bit and talk about serverless computing, which is something you may have heard of. So whereas EC2 uh, is going to be the option for, uh, again, you know, having full control over your application using the Amazon machine image, uh, you know, to basically be able to uh, you know, bootstrap and install uh, you know, specifically the, uh, the uh, packages and uh, applications that you want that EC2 instance to run, you've got the flexibility around that software component. And then as we just talked about, um, all the hardware components as well, you know, how much memory, how much compute by choosing those instance families. Now, what if you don't want to worry about all those components there? What if you just have uh, a script or a function or something that you want to run um, and you don't want to worry about all the nitty gritty details uh, that sit beneath that with regards to, again, you know, um, spinning up the uh, infrastructure uh, to manage that application? So with serverless computing, uh, you have the ability to build and run applications and services without managing the servers that we just talked about, right? So we can still get the outcome um, of you know, running specific code that we have um, or a function, as I talked about, um, without, again, having to manage all the underlying components. And so, again, key benefits here, uh, no servers to provision or manage. Uh, we don't have to worry about those components. Uh, we can actually still get scaling uh, built in, availability, and fault tolerance built into that. And again, one of the benefits we talked about with EC2, and even more so, is never paying for idle, uh, idling resources. So if you think back to our EC2 instances, we had that web server. Well, again, that web server, even if we choose the right instance type for that, and even if we choose uh, you know, savings plan or, or another type of um, uh, you know, a pricing model for that, we might still have only 50% of the load or 50% of the traffic going into that instance at any given time. So the extra 50% there, even if you know, it does occasionally spike up and down uh, or you know, spike up to that 100%, the majority of the time, if that's spending uh, on average around 50% utilization, there's some, there's some waste in there, right? And so uh, this is where serverless can actually help us, is if we can uh, run our applications uh, you know, in a serverless manner, we can actually save by never paying uh, for idling resources uh, and the inefficiency along with that. Right type of EC2 instance to run our application, um, you know, potentially network it, put it within you know, a VPC and all the components around you know, um, uh, managing that infrastructure. With Lambda, essentially we're just adding our code to a Lambda function. Uh, we're telling it when specifically it needs to run. And then after it's run and done the job that, we, that, we, uh, you know, that happens within that Lambda code, uh, it's going to stop executing and we're going to stop paying for it. Right? So some major benefits there um, around uh, using uh, AWS Lambda. Now, AWS Lambda is going to be good for certain cases where, again, uh, you know, we have code that we want to, 
uh, you know, or snippets of code or functions that we want to run. For long running applications, that's where you would look at something typically like um, you know, EC2. So slight difference in, in the service types there, but again, uh, if your application can run off of, let's say many different uh, you know, um, uh, Lambda functions, uh, then that's a great way, again, to save on those, uh, you know, never having idle, idle resources running, um, and then also uh, being able to just focus on your code um, and not uh, supporting that, that long running application on an EC2 instance. So let's actually look at an example of uh, utilizing uh, Lambda. So here's an example of you know, creating thumbnails with a Lambda, kind of a, a simple example, right? So let's say we have a user that uploads a full-size image, and we want to convert that image into a much smaller image, let's say for a profile picture, um, or again, you know, a thumbnail uh, that is a more kind of compressed, shrunk image uh, to store, right? So what we'll do in this case is maybe we'll upload the full-size image from our user or from our application into S3, uh, which we'll talk about in the storage section coming up. Uh, we store that image into that location, um, and then S3, as, as a service, can actually send an event uh, notification to our Lambda function to say, hey, this new image, uh, this full-size image, has landed in this storage location, in this uh, S3 bucket. So in a way, uh, S3 is actually going to trigger our Lambda function, and we can configure it um, so that as soon as that full-size image uh, ends up in our bucket, our Lambda will go ahead and run the job that we tell it to. And that job could be, again, resizing the image. It'll take that image. Um, it'll shrink it down uh, you know, with some code that we've written or some libraries that we've included. Um, and then in the final result here, Lambda will go ahead and take that, that, that shrunk down image and send it to another bucket where our, uh, let's say, all of our compressed or you know, um, um, thumbnail images are located. Um, so this is a great way to actually uh, you know, create that little pipeline there to get all of our you know, full-size images stored in one bucket. And then, uh, you know, via that, that um, you know, event-driven architecture, we can have our Lambda function grab those full-size images and convert them into the smaller images and save it into another bucket. So we have two copies um, of that. Now, a, a big thing here that we're, um, that we're looking at, we don't have any servers to provision or manage. We're only managing the compute through our Lambda function. And again, it's, it's, in, it's a you know, serverless context here. Um, so we don't have to worry about you know, a long-running application that is waiting for those, uh, you know, those images to, uh, to be sent into that application. Right? So the key benefit here that we're talking about is no servers to provision or manage. It's going to run. We're going to pay for you know, the amount of time that that Lambda function takes to run. And then that's it. We don't have to worry about instances that are running for you know, a full 24 hours uh, waiting for those images. So as we're talking about serverless here, you know, Lambda is, uh, again, the center point, I would say. There's many other serverless services uh, within AWS that can kind of uh, you know, be integrated together. Uh, we saw the event notification from S3 as an example. But let's see other applications and use cases for, uh, for serverless. So in the example that we just gave with Lambda, we're doing something very simple. We're basically having a client or a user um, or an application uh, save a or you know, send a full uh, JPEG or some image into uh, an S3 bucket, and then Lambda is going to go ahead and uh, compress it for us or shrink the image down and send it to another location. Pretty simple, right? Um, but what if we want to create you know, an entire backend? Well, we can also do that in a serverless fashion uh, as well. We can have many different Lambda functions and other services within AWS that will uh, integrate with Lambda um, so that we can create an entirely serverless backend. So think in this case of not having uh, you know, a full running EC2 instance um, or running web server to uh, you know, wait for those types of requests to come in. Um, and so that would be kind of that event-driven context where you know, based on, let's say, a new user signing up to our application or a new image coming in, uh, we can go ahead and handle those events, that sequence of, of events uh, you know, from that point on. Um, so again, you know, the, the main benefit here is we can even do more sophisticated things uh, like you know, creating entire backends, doing maybe full data processing or creating reports, uh, maybe even having chatbots um, you know, or uh, other IT automation uh, you know, tasks, all serverless in the backend there, um, and we don't have any running or you know, worst case, idling resources. So that's kind of the main advantage uh, to go in the serverless route. So in some cases, uh, you might not want to run a full EC2 instance for the you know, 24 hours or you know, full month uh, you know, you might have a, a job or something that is going to take a shorter period of time, um, but maybe it needs to run longer than it would on a, uh, on a Lambda that we talked about, right? So in that case, uh, containers can really help us here. We actually have a service 
uh, called Elastic Container Service for orchestrating uh, the execution of your containers um, on EC2 instances, as an example. Right? And we'll talk about you know, how that works. Um, it maintains and scales the fleet of nodes uh, that run your containers and removes the complexity of standing up the infrastructure. So we've got kind of a hybrid here or a hybrid choice between long running EC2 instances where we have full applications running on a full instance um, and you know just the basically snippets of code um, that are running on a Lambda function, right? So we have kind of a good balance uh, between the two here. And so uh, I would highly recommend if you're not familiar with, uh, with containers that you have a you know, quick look at uh, different ways to run this. Uh, but again, we have a service that you can run your containers on top of uh, something like EC2. So ECS actually gives us the ability to schedule and orchestrate our containers, as they're called, across multiple uh, or a fleet of EC2 instances. And typically, this is a complex activity because it requires uh, determining where uh, you might place those instances uh, or place those, uh, those containers using the uh, placement engine, um, and then also managing how these containers either speak to each other or manage jobs. And so the ECS service uh, gives us the ability to manage containers uh, at scale on EC2. All right, and as we're at the end of the section here, let's do a quick knowledge check. So the answer here is B. So fully managed compute service, that's Lambda. That's not a feature of EC2. But with EC2, we do have a broad selection of instance types for different workloads, multiple different pricing options as we talk about, as well as uh, per second billing. We do have complete control over the instance um, and can even access uh, the instance remotely. And finally, a reusable templates for launching additional instances using those Amazon uh, machine images. So in this section, we talked a lot about compute and even serverless. Next up, we're going to talk about storage. So now let's talk about storage on AWS. We have a number of different storage options depending on your application's needs. Uh, we're going to go into a little bit more detail on S3, as we mentioned before. Uh, S3 is scalable, highly durable object storage in the cloud. We've also got S3 Glacier uh, for low cost, highly durable archive storage in the cloud. Uh, we mentioned also EFS a little bit earlier, scalable network file storage uh, for multiple EC2 instances. And we've also got other uh, services. We talked about uh, hybrid a little bit earlier. Uh, with Storage Gateway, uh, we've got a hybrid cloud storage service that gives you on-premises access to virtually unlimited cloud storage. And then last, we also mentioned EBS, or Elastic Block Store. And this is network attached uh, volumes that, pr that provide durable block storage for EC2 instances. So we're going to go a little bit more in-depth on, uh, on S3 as a service here. So first up, let's talk about Amazon S3, or the Simple Storage Service. S3 is object-level storage, which essentially means if you want to change part of a file, you're going to modify that file uh, and then actually re-upload the entire modified file to the service. And again, that's the nature of object-level uh, uh, storage. S3 is designed for what we call 11 nines of durability. Um, and if you're not familiar with the concept of durability, it's the probability that an object will remain intact and accessible after a period of one year. So extremely durable storage um, is what Amazon S3 is built for. A couple other things to note about the objects that you're storing in S3, there's actually no upper limit to the amount of data that you can store in S3. However, uh, there are a couple things to note about how large those files can be. Uh, so the individual files, the individual objects that you'll store in S3 cannot be larger than five terabytes. But again, uh, you can store as many of those files as you need to. S3 also has a number of other neat features like event triggers or notifications, which enable you to receive notifications when certain events happen in your S3 bucket. So uh, you could basically, you know, upon uh, a new object uh, being created or maybe an object's being removed, uh, you can publish a notification to, uh, you know, other services like, uh, you know, SNS uh, to be notified. And this is great for cases when you want to know when a new object becomes available. Um, and then you can even trigger other downstream actions like we saw earlier with AWS Lambda. S3 objects are stored within buckets, uh, which are basically like containers that you create. Uh, you can also enable replication of objects between different buckets to create uh, additional copies um, of that data within the same region or maybe even a, a different region if you need to. And then similar to our pricing discussion before with uh, EC2, you can also utilize different pricing models for storing your data depending on uh, different access patterns that you might have uh, for your application. Your application. 
Um, and then also with those S3 storage classes, uh, you also have the ability to choose how your data is stored uh, for different performance access requirements. So uh, let's say you don't want multiple uh, you know, redundant copies of that data. Um, you can actually spend a little bit less on the storage of that data if that's not a requirement for your application. So uh, again, like we talked about with EC2, you do have the flexibility of choosing uh, the pricing model that works best for you and uh, using the right requirements for your application. Some use cases that are important to understand for S3, uh, content storage and distribution. So if you have software that your company is looking to distribute either to end clients or end users, uh, you could use S3 for that. Backup and archive storage, right? Great place to just store lots and lots and lots of data. Uh, another example of that might be uh, big data analytics, my personal favorite. So if your company is collecting lots of data from multiple source systems, basically keeping all of those in one location and then being able to analyze those with additional services uh, after the fact. Disaster recovery, um, so really important to be able to maintain your data in the case of, let's say, on-premises, an application or your storage uh, uh, layer fails, having the ability to uh, you know, pull that data back from S3. And then finally, uh, static website hosting. And really with the click, you know, two clicks of a button, uh, you can actually stand up a, a full static website on, uh, on S3, it's pretty easy. So there's a few main things to understand about the S3 service. Um, it's, built in, and it's built to store and retrieve data um, it offers fast, durable, highly available access to your objects. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, you can store an unlimited number of those objects in a bucket, and a bucket is the uh, container for all of those objects. Um, and you can store and retrieve data at any time from anywhere on the web. And that's really the power of S3, being able to access your objects from any application or any end client that you need to be able to do, uh, access them from. So let's actually look at an example here of you know, what that round trip looks like. Uh, so you might have a client, let's say either an end user through a browser or web interface, or potentially an application that is looking to get data or retrieve data from uh, S3. So uh, the first step here is the client from, let's say the web browser is gonna go ahead and send a request onto S3, to the S3 bucket, uh, for a specific object that it wants to retrieve. S3 is gonna check things like authentication and authorization, and if everything looks good, it's gonna go ahead and return that object uh, back to the client over HTTPS. So really, that's where the simple part of simple storage service comes in. It's very easy to uh, retrieve and store data into the S3 uh, bucket. So as we mentioned earlier, uh, you know, choosing a region. So S3 is a great example of where uh, you might choose one region or another, and we'll talk about uh, you know, some of those uh, examples here. Uh, you might recall we talked about data residency, right? So your data might need to reside within one geography or one country uh, based on, uh, let's say, you know, compliance needs or regulations within the uh, country that you're operating out of. So a question here that you might have um, is you know, checking if there are any relevant region uh, you know, data privacy laws uh, for hosting your data in one region versus another. All right, and something important to understand about S3 is uh, our S3 buckets are tied to a region. It's a regional construct. Um, so essentially, we're going to choose our, you know, when we're storing our data in our S3 bucket, we're going to choose what region we want that data to be stored in. Second thing here, when we're choosing a region for our S3 buckets, is proximity of users to our data. And as we mentioned earlier, uh, we want to actually have the least amount of latency possible for our end users or end applications to retrieve that data from S3. And then the last thing is cost effectiveness. Again, uh, we mentioned before, cost vary, uh, you know, cost can vary by region. Uh, you know, it costs us different uh, amounts of money to operate in those different geographies based on different uh, you know, power and electricity and utilities um, and all kinds of other costs. And so where uh, it's cheaper to actually host your data in one region or another, uh, again, we pass those cost savings along to customers so you can choose a region that is uh, you know, more cost effective uh, for your needs. So let's move on to Amazon S3 Glacier. So um, S3 Glacier is gonna be long-term data storage for archival and data backup purposes. Um, what's different about S3 Glacier versus S3 is we're gonna have very, very low cost storage. And that allows us to store lots and lots and lots of data um, if we know that we need to keep it for, again, those archival purposes, compliance purposes, um, or maybe just wanna keep original forms of content um, and large amounts of data that we don't necessarily need to retrieve very often, right? So whereas S3 is going to provide us the ability to access that data um, as soon as we need it very, very quickly, um, S3 Glacier um, will basically store the data in that archive or that backup state um, and then when we need to retrieve it, there's various different options that we can choose there. Um, but again, the benefit here is we can store large volumes of data at a very low cost uh, you know, per, per um, object or per um, amount of data that we're storing. In fact, customers can store data for as little as $1 per terabyte per month. So this is a huge cost savings over on-premises solutions. 
When it comes to retrieving data from S3 Glacier, you have a few different options there as well. You can use expedited retrieval to get your archive data back within as little as one to five minutes. Glacier also provides the sa uh, same 11 nines of durability that we mentioned earlier with S3, and also supports write once, read many access to data. So this can actually help uh, meet your compliance controls with immutable policies within Glacier. So some use cases to look at here. Uh, a great example is maybe a media asset workflow. Uh, maybe you're a production company uh, in storing um, original raw uh, footage that is you know, very large in size. Um, but most often, you're probably going to either downsample or uh, you can change the format um, of that original content. And you're probably not going to need those original copies very often. So an example here is maybe you know, taking that, that data or taking that raw form and storing it into Glacier again, at that very low cost storage rate. Another one here might be uh, healthcare information archiving, right? So really important data that you do need to maintain um, is, is you know, vital to, to be able to keep that data, but you might have, again, large volumes of it. So a more economical way to, uh, to store that data would be through S3 Glacier, because you probably don't need to uh, you know, access some parts of that archive uh, as often. And then last year, maybe regulatory and compliance archiving, uh, amongst many other uh, different examples, but basically having the ability to store large volumes of data at a very low cost point. So we referenced this a little bit earlier, um, Amazon Elastic Block Store, or EBS, and uh, we talked about it within the context of an application, let's say, that's running on EC2. And so EBS, we can use as a way to persist block storage uh, for our EC2 instances or applications that are running. right? Um, a couple things to note about EBS. Um, we support multiple or have multiple different types of uh, uh, EBS volumes or different drive types uh, for your specific application's needs. Um, so we support uh, both solid state and then al also hard disk uh, backed EBS instances um, so that you can choose the right EBS type for the, uh, the workload or application that you have. Um, you can also scale up or scale down in minutes. So if you need to increase the size or the amount of storage that you're storing within our, your EBS volumes, uh, you can do that very easily. You're only paying for what you provision. Again, that pay-as-you-go that we talked about earlier. Um, if you increase either the size or uh, you know, change uh, you know, the volume type or increase the number of EBS volumes, uh, you're only paying for what you're provisioning. And then last, probably something that's really important for uh, your instances or applications that are running, is the ability to actually maintain or preserve backups, uh, point in time snapshots, as we call it, uh, you know, snapshots of your EBS volumes. And so this enables you to be able to revert back to your previous state um, or potentially even copy over data to other EC2 instances as well. Last thing actually to mention on this is uh, you know, the security layer. We're going to talk about security coming up in a bit as well. Uh, but encryption is also available for your EBS volumes. So now that we've talked about storage a little bit here, let's go ahead and do a, another knowledge check. So which of the classic block store or EBS? That's going to be our block storage, right? Different from object-based storage. Uh, storage gateway, we talked about within the context of hybrid uh, uh, cloud or hybrid uh, storage uh, options, right? Storage gateway. Uh, EFS as a way to connect file system to uh, multiple EC2 instances. S3, uh, we talked about within that, uh, you know, within the context of object-based storage. So that one sounds uh, most right at this point or, or most correct. Um, and then Amazon Machine Images, or AMIs, right? Uh, which are used to boot our, um, our uh, EC2 instances, or as a template for our EC2 instances. So uh, the answer to this one is S3, right, um, is, is D here. So S3 is our object-based storage uh, that we can use for files and you know, storing lots and lots of data uh, within AWS. Next up, let's talk about databases on AWS. AWS has the broadest selection of purpose-built databases for all your application needs, and allows you to scale your largest and most complex workloads so that you can grow to reach more customers. And as you can see here, we have a selection within a few different database types um, and a number of different databases that could, or database services that could meet your needs. We're going to go into a little bit more detail on this. First, I want to talk about do-it-yourself, or DIY, versus AWS database services as we just saw. So one thing I want to mention here is you are more than welcome to run your database of choice on EC2, right? We talked about EC2 instances uh, as having the ability to launch whatever kind of application that you want, right? You really have the flexibility to run your workloads on EC2, whatever those might be. 
And so what this grants us, if we decide that we want to run uh, our database on EC2, we then have operating system access, right? That might be something that we need. And we might also have certain features uh, within that database or a specific application that we need to access. On the other hand, versus that you know, do-it-yourself, we have the AWS database services that we mentioned. And so the difference here is that our AWS database services, they're easy to set up, they're easy to manage, and they're easy to maintain. In a lot of cases, we have push button high availability. We can really focus on performance and not uh, performance tuning and tweaking of the underlying settings um, on EC2. And then also we're doing this on top of a managed infrastructure. So going back to that point we talked about before of that unmanaged versus managed option, AWS database services are a more managed option for running databases for your application. So you can spend less time performance tuning and tweaking your uh, database on EC2 and really just worry about the connection or uh, the uh, right and um, uh, access patterns of your data uh, working with your between your database and your, your application. So you can focus more time on performance there. So let's go ahead and explore a few different AWS database options. And we're going to talk through a couple of the, the important ones here uh, or you know, commonly used uh, options here. So kind of going down the list, um, you know, two different uh, aspects that, that we can explore. You might have the need for transactional databases. Uh, maybe you're even doing data analytics or need to explore relationships of data. And you might even have the need for in-memory data stores or caching purposes for your applications, right? So those are you know, common use cases. There's also different databases that can be used in different scenarios within each of those. So for a transactional database, we might have the need for a, a SQL base or, um, uh, or NoSQL based uh, solution. We'll talk about RDS as the SQL based option or relational option, uh, and then DynamoDB as the non relational option there. For data analytics, uh, we can actually uh, store lar uh, large volumes of data, uh, again, in that relational um, uh, format with Amazon Redshift, uh, or we can even use a NoSQL uh, you know, style with uh, Amazon Neptune. And then finally, uh, in memory uh, data store and caching, we've got ElastiCache. Um, to add caching or a caching layer to our applications. So let's go ahead and explore uh, you know, a few of these in a little bit more detail. So first up, we have Amazon RDS, or Relational Database Service. And the RDS service uh, makes it easy to set up, operate, and scale a relational database in the cloud. It provides cost-efficient and resizable capacity while managing time-consuming database administration tasks. And that frees you up to focus your applications or focus on your applications and your business. So a couple things to note about RDS here. Uh, it supports uh, six familiar database engines that you can choose from, uh, including Amazon Aurora, which we'll talk about, Oracle, My uh, Microsoft SQL Server, Postgres, uh, and also um, uh, MariaDB. We've also got Amazon Aurora, which is a MySQL and Postgres compatible relational database built for the cloud. And it combines the performance and availability of high-end commercial databases with the simplicity and cost-effectiveness of open source databases. So as you can see here, uh, Aurora is built for high availability and durability, concepts that we are familiar with so far. Uh, it's built for high performance, high scalability, uh, it also provides uh, multi-region capabilities, um, and is also compatible uh, with your um, uh, MySQL and Postgres uh, relational databases. Last thing to mention here that's important about Aurora, Aurora is up to five times faster than standard MySQL databases, all while providing security, availability, and reliability of commercial grade databases at a tenth of the cost. Next up, we have Amazon DynamoDB. And DynamoDB is a fast and flexible non-relational database service for applications that need consistent single digit millisecond latency at any scale. And we'll talk about more examples of that. It's also a fully managed cloud database and supports both document and key value store models. So as you can see here, uh, fully managed, we get fast, consistent performance with DynamoDB, and we also have additional benefits like fine-grained access control uh, with identity and access management. Just talking quickly about a few DynamoDB use cases, companies in the gaming vertical use DynamoDB in all capabilities of game platforms, including game state, player data, session history, and leaderboards. And so the other thing to note about uh, DynamoDB is there's no operational overhead. So uh, game developers can focus on developing their games instead of actually managing databases. So to conclude this section, let's do another quick knowledge check. So which of the Aurora, RDS, and Redshift all have that relational format? 
Whereas uh, DynamoDB has, again, that flexibility uh, for document and also uh, key-based or key, uh, key value store uh, within DynamoDB. At AWS, cloud security is the highest priority. As an AWS customer, you'll benefit from a data center and network architecture that is built to meet the requirements of the most security sensitive organizations. The AWS infrastructure has been architected to be one of the most flexible and secure cloud computing environments available today. A key way to look at security on AWS, especially as a customer, is using the shared responsibility model. If you haven't seen this before, I'm gonna walk you through a couple of the uh, key components. So this chart, the really important thing to understand is where that line lies in the middle. So the bottom components there are AWS's responsibility, AWS global infrastructure, the regions we talked about, availability zones, and the edge locations, as well as foundation services like compute, storage, databases, and networking. And that bottom component there, AWS's responsibility, a way that we like to talk about that is AWS is responsible for the security of the cloud. Above the line there, the customer responsibility, customers are responsible for security in the cloud. And so, so some key things to keep in mind here, your customer data uh, sitting on AWS, let's say within uh, S3, we provide various different tools and mechanisms that uh, make it easy to encrypt your data in transit and also uh, at rest, let's say within uh, S3. But the important piece to understand is that you have the flexibility of choosing what are the right uh, either encryption mechanisms or uh, different security practices uh, that are right for your specific application. And you get the ability to check uh, and, and change the different uh, configurations um, as you see fit for your specific use case. But there's also a plethora of other services uh, that can be utilized, security services within AWS uh, that can be utilized um, for, for securing your applications. So we're going to talk about a really key one here, um, identity and access. Uh, we're going to talk about a key one here, AWS Identity and Access Management, or IAM. IAM gives you the ability to securely control access to your AWS resources. You can assign granular permissions to users, groups, and roles. You can share temporary access to your AWS account and also federate users in your corporate network or with an internet identity provider. Let's look at some of the key components of identity and access management. So the core components of identity and access management, we have the ability to create users, as I mentioned. Let's say a person, uh, maybe an employee, or an application that interacts with AWS. You've got groups, which is a collection of those users with identical permissions, so an easy way to manage permissions across multiple users uh, with IAM. And then you've also got roles, which are temporary privileges that an entity, such as a user, uh, could assume. The other component of that, aside from you know, the who in our environment, is we have uh, what they can do, the permissions and the policies that surround that. And so identity and access management gives us the ability to define permissions to control which AWS resources those users or those groups can access. It also helps us meet identity and access control standards within our organization, such as authentication and authorization. The authentication piece here being the, you know, who you are, right? And proving that you are who you say you are to identity and access management. The second piece there is even if you've proven who you are, are you authorized? Do you have the ability to gain access to certain services within AWS? And so identity and access management helps you control that. Let's look at one example here, a really core component, IAM users. So these users are not separate AWS accounts. They're users within your account. And each of those users are gonna have their own credentials that they can use to access different resources in the account. Additionally, IAM users are authorized to perform specific AWS uh, actions based on their permissions. So you can define and control who has access to different resources, uh, and often in a very granular uh, you know, uh, mechanism for doing that, you can control what they can do based on the permissions that you define. Identity and access management gives us the ability to control access to resources throughout our account. But we also have other access control mechanisms uh, within the services themselves. An example of this is within S3. So we talked about S3 for object storage. Um, S3 is an example of a service that we can have a resource-based policy, uh, which is called a bucket policy in S3. 
And so this example here, um, you know, as, as a, you know, maybe a, a new bucket that you've created as an owner, uh, you have the ability to say, um, I don't want anyone else to be able to access uh, these objects and this bucket that I've created in my account, right? So you can basically say, I don't want to give anyone else permissions to these resources in my bucket. That's the default when you create a new S3 bucket. Where these access controls come in for S3 and your resource-based policies, you can define a policy uh, over here on the, uh, the right-hand side uh, where, let's say, an owner plus additional users within the account have controlled access or, or specific access maybe to uh, certain objects that are located within that S3 bucket. So you get to define that in a much more fine-grained uh, way. AWS CloudTrail is another example of a service that we can use uh, for security in our AWS account. CloudTrail enables us to track user activity and API usage in our accounts. We can continuously monitor user activities and uh, record API calls against multiple different services in our account. We can use this for compliance, uh, you know, for auditing, uh, for security analysis, and also for troubleshooting purposes. If we can understand the API calls and uh, you know, where they're made against different services, uh, it'll help us troubleshoot uh, you know, within our account and then also record that activity uh, in case we need to backtrack and understand how access was, uh, was granted. And then last, we can actually deliver the uh, trail or the, the log files to our S3 buckets that we talked about earlier. And so by keeping all that information, we have the ability to answer common questions from a security standpoint about who made a request, what did they request, when did they make that request, and you know, where were they requesting from, or where did they send or initiate that request. So CloudTrail gives us the transparency in our account, um, and we can use that from a security standpoint. I also want to talk about AWS Trusted Advisor. And the way that I like to look at AWS Trusted Advisor is kind of the one-stop shop uh, to get the answer to uh, you know, how to improve across multiple different pillars or domains uh, within our AWS accounts. So as an example here, um, you know, cost optimization, uh, Trusted Advisor will actually give you um, potential monthly savings and ways to cut back on costs within your account. Um, and it's constantly looking um, over time at uh, you know, where you're spending and ways that you can improve on that spend. Also performance, security as we're talking about here, recommendations in terms of uh, things that you can do around encrypting, let's say EBS volumes, um, or uh, you know, certain uh, measures that you can take within your account to make sure that you're uh, more secure. Fault tolerance, and then also service limits uh, within your account. Are you utilizing uh, a certain resource and you're getting uh, close to a quota or a, an upper service limit um, on that uh, particular service? And so by looking at Trusted Advisor, um, you can look at the uh, various different things that you can do to improve the state of your account uh, based on best practices that we've learned with customers um, over many years. And then finally, we'll do a quick knowledge check at the end of this section. So which of the following are components of identity and access management? So that would be a group, a user, and a policy. Those are all key components of identity and access management. So now in section two, we're going to talk about innovation with AWS. We've actually got five key components of this section. We're going to talk about IoT, or Internet of Things on AWS. We'll talk about machine learning, blockchain, AWS Ground Station, and AWS Wavelength. With technology as the enabler of innovation, AWS is your trusted advisor and uniquely positioned to help your organization shift to an operating model optimized for innovation. First up, we're going to start off with IoT, or Internet of Things. So what is the Internet of Things, or IoT? IoT is where a system of integrated devices such as appliances, watches, features in a car, maybe even toasters, uh, can be connected to various applications. These connections enable the data to be transferred to and from devices in a bi-directional communication flow uh, over a network. And so telemetry data can actually be uh, collected and captured from various embedded sensors, microcontrollers, actuators, processors, and communication hardware that is in the surrounding environment. Automating data collection can reduce the need for human-to-human -human or human-to-computer interactions. IoT is sometimes referred to as Internet of Everything. With the number of devices that we have today, uh, billions of IoT devices coming online, there's some inherent challenges with managing large fleets of these things. First of all is overall updates. We've got devices with firmware, uh, potentially, again, microcontrollers or sensors uh, that have very lightweight uh, firmware and, uh, and hardware. And we need to be able to keep those in sync and updated 
So there's issues with sometimes network connectivity. These sensors or these you know, devices uh, may be on ships or on uh, various different you know, moving objects uh, where they don't consistently have good connections to the internet. Um, so that's one issue that uh, could arise. The second is devices are remote and may not actually be physically accessible. They may be kind of built into uh, equipment and we may not be able to readily uh, uh, um, you know, connect wires to them and be able to update them. And last, we have potentially large fleets of devices in production that we have to manage. How do we manage all of the communication to and from uh, those sensors and maybe between uh, the various different uh, things and sensors? The other part of this is from the analytics standpoint is we have very low compute power, maybe low spec on device uh, resources. So we may not be able to do uh, you know, calculations or much in the way of analytics on board on the device. So how do we actually get that data out to a place where we can process it? And so these devices may also emit very large quantities or large volumes of streaming data uh, that we need to analyze at a later point. So how do we actually get that data out? How do we manage all of these devices from that remote standpoint? AWS has IoT services for much of the areas that we just talked about. If you need to potentially take data off of those devices, stream them into a central location, and uh, analyze them, we have solutions like AWS IoT Analytics, uh, IoT Events, uh, and IoT Things Graph. From the standpoint of managing device software, we have Free RTOS, IoT Device SDK, IoT Greengrass, and IoT Device Tester. And then last, how do we actually connect and control uh, these various different devices and provide services that allow us to be able to uh, manage the messaging and communication between these different devices. And so for that, uh, we have IoT Core, we've got IoT Device Management, and IoT Device Defender. Customers in various industries are using AWS IoT for applications such as improving industrial processes, remotely monitoring patient health, improving safety in the home, office, and on the factory floor, and also for connected vehicle and autonomous driving capabilities. AWS IoT Core can use AWS services as building blocks and to set up a secure and powerful IoT deployment. With AWS IoT, you can build solutions that help you respond to events in near real time and reduce your concerns about scale, enabling you to focus more on your core business. So as you can see here, AWS IoT is connected uh, to multiple different AWS services, some that we've talked about already uh, today. So AWS Lambda, a key example of that, DynamoDB for your database layer, even other services we haven't talked about, like Kinesis for streaming analytics. AWS IoT Greengrass extends AWS to your devices, and you can use it on your own hardware. It can be used to locally extend Lambda functions and also enable local messaging between devices. Bayer Crop Science uses AWS IoT for collection, processing, and analysis of seed growing data. This solution captures terabytes of data and enables analysts to be able to pull up dashboards from the collection platform. Using AWS IoT, visibility into field conditions are more readily accessible, and data can be analyzed much more quickly. So now let's talk about machine learning on AWS. First of all, the question, what is machine learning? So you might be familiar with machine learning in various different applications, which we'll talk about in a moment here, but let's kind of talk about the spectrum uh, in terms of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and also something called deep learning. So artificial intelligence, starting off with AI, um, really any technique that uh, enables computers to be able to mimic uh, human intelligence, right? And this can be simple uh, you know, logic or if-then statements, uh, can be programmed by hand if you want, because it mimics uh, human intelligence, right? Now, a subset of that, uh, we have machine learning, which is actually going to utilize uh, you know, machines and uh, lots and lots of data uh, to search for patterns in that data to build logic and uh, models automatically. Um, so essentially, with machine learning, we can have the machine learn based off of patterns in that data uh, on its own to come up with its own paradigms and uh, find out its own uh, you know, patterns in that data. And then again, another subset of machine learning, uh, we have deep learning. And uh, this is actually going to use a multi-layered approach, uh, things like neural networks uh, to perform tasks like speech and image recognition, and often you know, require lots and lots more data and many more features. 
We're going to focus on machine learning here, but we will come back to the full spectrum uh, in terms of AWS uh, AI and ML uh, solutions in a moment. Let's start off using some examples that we already made now. So Amazon.com, uh, obviously many, many, many customers and also uh, you know, many products being sold daily. Um, and as customers are looking through different products and reading through different product pages, uh, that data is being used to generate recommendations for customers on potentially what they might like uh, to buy next or what they'd like to browse. And so this is kind of a classic machine learning problem where you've got a very large set of potential products uh, which each have multiple different features and descriptions and images. And you've got many, many, many consumers uh, and customers of Amazon.com that are browsing through that catalog uh, and looking through each of those daily. And so where we have very, very large feature sets uh, and potentially a large number of uh, potential recommendations, machine learning is a really, really good fit here. So lots of different applications. We could talk about uh, you know, image recognition, which we'll come back to in a moment. We could also talk about Alexa um, as a solution for that. Many, many interactions uh, with the Alexa service uh, every, every week. Um, and so using all of that data to basically be able to uh, you know, crunch all the data and all the different features of that data to generate recommendations and improve service uh, you know, for, uh, for customers. Within AWS, we see the machine learning and AI services uh, essentially, the stack is having three layers. The bottom layer of the stack is for expert machine learning practitioners who work uh, with the framework or at the framework level uh, and are comfortable building, training, tuning, and deploying machine learning models. The middle uh, ML services layer provides features and tooling for developers and machine learning experts to use a more managed option and increasing the speed at which they train, tune, and deploy their machine learning models. The top layer that we see here, these AI services, uh, can be integrated and used pretty much immediately in applications where developers have little experience or time uh, for developing models from scratch. So let's go ahead and take a closer look at that middle layer of the ML services with Amazon SageMaker. So SageMaker is really the uh, you know, key place where uh, machine learning experts and, uh, data, and data scientists are going to be able to uh, prepare, build, train, tune, and deploy and manage all from within SageMaker. And there's various different uh, features and uh, tools within SageMaker that help along those different stages of that process. So an example here we have within the preparation phase, uh, you know, ground truth is a way to generate labels for training data. Um, we've also got uh, SageMaker Studio Notebooks. Um, so essentially, you know, machine learning uh, uh, scientists and experts can you know, create their models uh, within a SageMaker Notebook and have access to data that they may have in S3. Um, and within a familiar uh, you know, interface, they're able to, again, be able to build their models and then even do their training, tuning, uh, uh, deploying, and then management all from within those notebooks. So we have you know, various different uh, features. within SageMaker that make it a lot easier to manage machine learning projects. Um, and then there's also the new uh, SageMaker Studio, which is the first IDE or integrated development environment for machine learning. So it's basically the you know, one place where uh, you can go to manage all the different phases of machine learning projects from within, let's say, SageMaker Studio um, uh, or you know, SageMaker Studio or uh, various different notebooks. Just a use case here. Uh, some people may be familiar with this one from the recent uh, Super Bowl. Um, but uh, the National Football League, or NFL, um, has engaged with the, uh, the Amazon Machine Learning uh, Solutions Lab. Um, and they had a problem where they basically were generating terabytes, uh, three plus terabytes of data uh, and uh, over 1,500 hours of playtime per week. They were gathering lots and lots of data but needed a solution for real-time stats um, for uh, you know, reporters and uh, sports announcers to be able to get those stats uh, during the game while it's being played. And so the solution here was something called next-gen stats. Uh, and so live data was streamed to AWS um, from RFID tags uh, on the players themselves and the ball that was being used in-game. 
uh, data was being processed in 100 uh, you know, plus steps uh, in under a second, which is pretty amazing. Um, and then again, those machine learning models were built uh, within Amazon SageMaker so that predictions could be made in real time. So that's kind of a good uh, real life application of being able to generate that data and report on uh, those metrics for all the fans and again, the newscasters and uh, sports announcers to get that information uh, as the game is being played in real time. So next, let's take a look at that top layer, the AI services part of the stack. So one example here is Amazon recognition. And so recognition allows uh, for object and scene detection. So if you want to be able to uh, generate metadata or tags uh, for you know, various photos, let's say to do cataloging or searching or management of those. Uh, we'll see facial analysis in a moment here, but uh, be able, being able to understand demographics of let's say customers or maybe sentiment um, of those customers in store as they're browsing and, and shopping. Um, maybe face comparison. Um, so if we want to uh, be able to determine uh, is the person that just walked through the door, let's say in a, in a, um, uh, in a hotel, uh, are they a, a current guest? Did they stay with us, stayed with us before? Uh, and things of that nature. Um, and then you know, various other kind of facial recognition uh, uh, components as well. So recognition allows uh, us to be able to take photos and uh, you know, extract data from those photos uh, that would be relevant for various different applications. So one example within recognition there is uh, object and scene detections, right? Taking a photo and uh, having it essentially you know, tag and identify different objects uh, from within that photo. So an example here, um, you can see we have a man and a woman sitting down at a table uh, looking like maybe they're at a restaurant and uh, it looks like the waiter is maybe holding a pen and a notebook. And so that's all data that we have from within that photo that we may want to you know, catalog and then utilize as a way to either search for those photos um, or potentially uh, you know, within our machine learning project. So uh, recognition makes it really easy using detect labels uh, to determine you know, different objects that are within that uh, photo that we provided. Another option here is uh, maybe facial analysis, and going a little bit more in depth, really to show the power of uh, you know how this can how this can help, um, is you know analyzing facial characteristics um, and multiple different dimensions. So uh, one example is maybe uh, taking a uh, set of photos, um, determining you know maybe those are uh, photos of uh, current you know hotel guests or maybe customers or something like that, and being able to determine uh, you know are they happy, are they surprised, um, to see if they're you know happy with the service. Um, so that is you know, one example here. Uh, maybe we want to get a little bit more you know, detail. Do they fit within a certain age range uh, so that we can maybe enrich our data set uh, and be able to maybe send them uh, you know, specific targeted um, uh, ads or you know, promotions based on uh, you know, um, uh, qualities of, of the individual, right? So there's various different uh, use cases that we could have here, um, but detecting faces is, is a really unique one uh, where we can determine if uh, you know, someone in that image is, uh, is happy or is surprised. And as you can see here, um, not only are we getting a yes or no, we're getting uh, you know, much more granular than that. We're getting percentages um, and we're getting estimates on you know, how big their smile is and um, you know, whether they have certain facial landmarks or uh, you know, how much their, their head is tilted and things like that. Um, so detect faces uh, within recognition, also a really, really powerful way um, to be able to uh, identify uh, individual sentiment analysis and gather data from photos that we have. So next up, let's talk about blockchain. So some of you might be familiar with uh, different implementations of blockchain, possibly one of the most uh, uh, significant or um, uh, you know, recent implementations um, of blockchain is Bitcoin or Ethereum, right? Um, but blockchain can actually be used in a variety of other applications as well. And if you're not familiar with blockchain as a concept here, uh, blockchain makes it possible for, uh, to build applications where multiple parties uh, may need to you know, exchange transactions uh, and maybe there isn't a central authority uh, in that situation. So uh, we're dealing with the notion of decentralized trust. Um, but today, in order to use blockchain in a variety of different applications, it's actually uh, pretty difficult to get started. Um, so building a scalable blockchain network uh, with existing technologies, it's complex and it's hard to manage. And uh, there's a couple things that each of the network members in the blockchain, or that participate in the blockchain, uh, need to do. One is manually provisioning hardware, right? Some of the things we talked about before uh, that can be difficult to do on your own. Uh, installing the software, right? Uh, knowing what is the right version of the software uh, that needs to be implemented, um, and uh, also keeping those things up to date. Uh, creating and managing certificates for access control to the blockchain, um, and then also configuring, you know, network components. So none of these are, uh, you know, insignificant 
um, and especially for something as uh, you know complex as a blockchain can be in uh, as being implemented. So let's look at some example use cases for uh, blockchain here. So using the first one, shipping. Um, so blockchain can be used to ensure the entire history uh, and the integrity of that uh, of that history of a shipped item from let's say one country to another, um, and ensuring that as it's moving from uh, you know, one country to another and going through that entire shipping system all the way through uh, to delivery, we can ensure the integrity of uh, you know, that item all the way from you know, raw sourcing um, all the way through to delivery. And so we, what we can do is we can uh, independently audit and verify uh, the entire journey there to make sure that the item that was shipped and where it originated from is the item that we are receiving with a certain degree of confidence. Another uh, you know, really big use case here is something like finance and banking. And again, ensuring or you know, assuring that your transactions are legitimate um, and having a way to basically be able to agree amongst multiple different parties within the network um, that that transaction is valid and is, is correct. So lots of different applications. Um, also for digital advertising, so you might have uh, you know, end uh, users who are going to uh, get a certain ad, understanding where that ad originated from, um, and lots of other different applications as well. So let's talk about some of the qualities of blockchain that enable those use cases. So first is this idea of decentralized trust. And you know, we talked about financial institutions or maybe mortgage lenders basically being able to agree amongst multiple different lenders or parties um, uh, that a certain transaction that happened truly happened. They're able to uh, you know, agree on a sequence of steps um, or the origination of a loan and, and various components like that, right? Um, so all of the participants in the blockchain network here are able to agree on what had happened. And importantly, you know, they have the transparency to be able to do that. And so shifting over to the benefits here, blockchain gives us uh, lots of different benefits in terms of the transparency around those transactions that happen so that every member of that network is able to participate and have visibility to uh, you know, what, what transactions have happened and the, the data behind that. Um, immutability in terms of uh, the transaction can't be altered in any way. Um, one, once it has happened, um, that is uh, permanent in nature um, because if it happened, we need to verify that that truly happened. Um, auditability is one of the other, other benefits that we get there. Um, that can happen you know, from within a company or amongst uh, you know, entire, um, uh, you know, entire uh, industry, being able to audit that certain you know, controls uh, were, uh, were followed and certain regulations were followed. Um, so being able to ensure that that is the case. Um, permissionless, um, so the idea that we don't necessarily uh, you know, need to have certain central authorities uh, to be able to give you know, permission within the network there. Um, everyone is in agreement or not in agreement uh, based on a consensus model. So those are some of the qualities that we can utilize to extend for the use cases that we talked about there. Now, in order to get this decentralized trust, um, and the benefits that we, we talked about in order to realize those, um, we need to be able to set up the blockchain. So uh, as I mentioned before, it's actually quite complex to be able to set up a blockchain in terms of standing up the right infrastructure, using the right um, you know, applications and the right uh, you know, code to be able to do that. And so we need to talk about um, you know, a way to manage that uh, in some way that's still uh, you know, uh, not going to be centralized. And so uh, one solution to this is uh, the AWS blockchain services. And so these uh, Amazon Managed Blockchain is a fully managed service that makes it easy to create and manage a scalable blockchain uh, network using popular open source frameworks like Hyperledger Fabric and Ethereum, as we had mentioned before. Um, so this is something that makes it a lot easier for uh, you know, multiple parties that want to set up a blockchain, uh, potentially within an industry, um, or like I said, peers uh, on, on the network, uh, to be able to set up a, a blockchain to participate in. So a couple features to talk about with Amazon Managed Blockchain. Again, uh, we talked about you know, fully managed or managed options versus unmanaged. Um, the idea behind you know, fully managed in this case um, is that you don't necessarily need to wait weeks and weeks and weeks um, for the blockchain to be uh, built out according to the specification. Um, you can you know, create a blockchain network in just really a matter of minutes. Um, open source variety, so you have support for the two frameworks we talked about um, with uh, Hyperledger, Hyperledger Fabric and uh, Ethereum. Uh, decentralized, right? Uh, so democratically uh, govern the network so you don't have any one member that is more important than another member or can override or change or mutate the state of certain transactions. So everybody is equal in that case. Um, and lots of other you know, components of this, but also uh, low cost, very similar to the other services we talked about. 
only paying for the resources that are being used, right? Uh, and then finally, integrate it, of course, with other AWS services so that you can really take development on that blockchain uh, much further. So let's talk about one example of, uh, of this being used. So uh, Nestle is, is the largest producer of coffee in the world um, and wanted to uncover transparency uh, around its coffee bean supply. Uh, beyond just the brokers and suppliers. It really wanted to have an understanding of, again, you know, trace of the, uh, the raw materials and have more visibility into that. So it sounds very much like what we talked about earlier um, in you know, needing to have that transparency um, across you know, multiple different parties uh, within, the, within the chain here. And so uh, the solution, uh, Amazon Managed Blockchain, uh, to uh, basically trace back every single step uh, in, the, uh, in the supply chain from the farmer to uh, the grader to the roaster and then the packer, right? So you think about all the steps that go along in that typical process of actually growing and sourcing uh, or, you know, sourcing. sourcing and growing the, uh, the um, uh, coffee beans um, all the way through to when those are being packed and then eventually sold, right? Um, so This is a great use case where you have you want to understand the supply chain. Uh, in the case where uh, you know largest amount of uh, you know coffee being procured around the world, I'm um, being able to. understand uh, you know, all the different participants in that network there and being able to have transparency over each step in the process. So next up we have AWS Ground Station. And uh, AWS Ground Station is probably one of my favorite services that I've launched in, in the past two years. Um, and the reason for that is because Uh, you know, sending satellites into space um, is becoming more and more and more common and accessible. Um, and so we're getting more data back uh, from those satellites than ever before that we can utilize in real world use cases. So some examples of where we can use satellite data, weather forecasting in agriculture. Um, so being able to monitor, um, you know, from uh, commercial fruit producers, uh, the crop health and maybe use of water, uh, you know, across fields and uh, water levels. Um, leads to higher efficiency use of those, um, you know, those resources. Another example, global shipping and anti-piracy, um, understanding you know, accurate ship positioning around the world and um, being able to uh, use satellite imagery and telemetry to do that. Um, Earth observation and fire safety, maybe helping fire commanders understand what is the lowest heat entry point uh, to fight fires, right, and the most efficient way to do that. I um, mean, then also retail forecasting. As simple as it may sound, understanding how many cars um, are parked in different, uh, you know, malls and locations where people shop uh, around the world can help uh, understand, you know, how often people are going out to stores um, and maybe how, you know, therefore how much money they're spending, um, you know, within those retail stores. But you know, getting this data back. So I talked about you know uh, sending satellites out uh, into into uh, orbit has become uh, you know much more accessible. Um, but there are still some challenges that remain, and uh, the challenges there are around you know getting that data in and analyzing it, and how accessible it is to get that data back. Right. So even as it's become you know more common, more accessible to uh, uh, send satellites out to space, uh, the infrastructure required to be able to collect data back. Um, is, is you know, still uh, challenging for um, uh, governments, uh, higher education, uh, and, and also businesses. So uh, getting that data back for research purposes. Um, and the reason for that is because building, leasing, or purchasing uh, you know, undo, uh, un unused bandwidth um, you know, is, is required in that case. Um, so that is the onus is on those institutions to have to do. Um, the uh, actual ground antennas in this case um, are difficult to maintain and uh, it requires a, ha a high ca uh, capital expenditure um, uh, to actually, you know, scale up for collecting that data. So even if you can get, you know, more satellites out into space and retrieve more data, um, there's still these, you know, challenges in terms of the actual infrastructure on Earth to be able to collect that data. And so that's where AWS Ground Station uh, comes in. So AWS Ground Station is a fully managed service that lets you control satellite communications 
process that data coming in, scaling your operations without having to worry about uh, building or managing your ground station infrastructure. Right? So thinking about those actual antennas uh, that you need to lease or to buy to retrieve that data um, it makes it a lot easier with the ground station service. And so what you're getting from a ground station there is direct access to AWS services, so being able to send that data out to, let's say, S3. Um, it's a fully managed service, so you don't have to worry about the infrastructure and scaling components underneath that. Um, Pay-as-you-go pricing, right? Pretty incredible that you can do that for that ground station uh, infrastructure there, very much like the other services we talked about, having the ability to just pay for the resources as you need them, and if you no longer need them uh, in the future, uh, you're no you can release them and you're no longer paying for them. There's no licensing uh, requirements there, um, and then you can scale your, um, your satellite communications as your business needs. So a couple things that uh, Ground Station offers us here. Um, again, we get the pay per minute pricing, self-service scheduling, so it makes it really easy uh, you know, for, uh, again, these institutions to be able to schedule the time, uh, to be able to take the data uh, you know, into, let's say, their environments, into S3, um, and then from there be able to you know, do the Um, the analysis and maybe even machine learning like we talked about before based on that data. We get near real-time data delivery, um, so really fast delivery of that data so we can uh, analyze it again very, very, very quickly. Um, and so overall, you know, Ground Station, really good solution for, uh, again, you know, governments, um, uh, colleges, and businesses to be able to, uh, you know, uh, take that data in very quickly and analyze and process it in near real time. And finally, we're going to talk about AWS Wave. Let's talk about a couple drivers for AWS Wavelength. First, today with the advancement of onboard capabilities for many mobile devices, uh, thinking sensors like we talked about before with IoT, video cameras, and many other devices that are generating large volumes of data, and often needing to you know, either compute or process uh, that data very close to the, uh, the, the point of data generation, such as you know, those sensors, with very low latency, there's a need to essentially have A, you know, more infrastructure behind the scenes there uh, to be able to uh, process that data uh, locally much more quickly. And so uh, there's another driver here in terms of 5G, right? And uh, mobile edge computing. So 5G proliferation, uh, you know, for the next four years, it's projected that 1.8 billion mobile subscribers um, are going to be on 5G or 5G ready equipment. Um, we have new use cases like uh, cloud gaming, uh, video streaming, AR, VR, um, IoT like we talked about, and also connected vehicles and other applications. And then finally, mobile edge computing. And uh, you know, certain applications, uh, you know, games in some cases as well, demand uh, requirements like low latency um, and local pro uh, processing on those mobile edge computing devices. And so these drivers are you know, some of the reasons for uh, a need for a product like AWS Wavelength. So AWS Wavelength combines the high bandwidth and ultra low latency of 5G networks with the AWS services that we talked about earlier to let developers innovate and build a new class of, uh, of applications using those, again, low latency and uh, high bandwidth from 5G. And so we're going to talk about some of the components here. Um, but essentially, we have scalable capacity within the communication service providers, or CSP, within those data centers that are managed and supported by AWS. A couple of characteristics of AWS Wavelength. So AWS Compute and Storage Infrastructure uh, is embedded inside the communication service provider uh, mobile network. So all the you know, processing and, uh, and storage can happen much more closely uh, you know, to the end user, and again, uh, you know, taking advantage of that low latency uh, for those specific applications. Uh, you then have access to services in the AWS region, so you can use the variety of other AWS services that we talked about. Um, and then also, uh, you can develop applications once and deploy them for use with uh, 5G networks uh, globally. A couple example use cases for AWS Wavelength. So uh, healthcare is one industry where Wavelength could uh, really make an impact. Uh, AI or machine learning solutions for 
um, uh, processing the images that are maybe taken from uh, multiple different types of equipment in hospitals, maybe you know, for radiology, and being able to do a real-time diagnosis on uh, you know, very large images, um, or maybe even video that is, that is taken from those machines. Um, connected vehicles, which we'll see an example of in a moment, um, and then also for smart factories. So an example use case for Wavelength here, uh, LG actually uses AWS Wavelength for low latency, high throughput, uh, and for uh, connected vehicles. Um, so that's a great use case for Wavelength where you maybe have uh, you know, autonomous or connected vehicles that need to be able to uh, send large volumes of data, potentially stream it in real time, um, process that data very, very quickly with low latency, and get either decisions or data points back to those vehicles um, over the 5G network without having to go all the way back to the regions that we described before. So excellent use case uh, for something like AWS Wavelength. And finally, next steps. So hopefully you've enjoyed our discussion about many of the different cloud services on AWS within compute, within storage, database, networking, and security. And also with some of the newer uh, innovation areas with things like IoT and blockchain and wavelength as we just talked about, uh, machine learning, um, and also with uh, ground station. So uh, let's go ahead and talk about some next steps and ways that you can learn more even after Awesome Day 2021. As next steps, I would invite you to choose your path. Uh, you can start building immediately. Uh, go to aws.amazon.com uh, to create uh, or log into your AWS account. We'll talk about some of the ways that you can start building on AWS in a moment. Uh, continue learning. I'll talk about some of the different tools uh, and resources that you have to really just take this a step further after our conversation this awesome day. And uh, finally, uh, if you want to demonstrate your knowledge, uh, you can sit for an exam and uh, potentially uh, obtain a certification in a number of different domains and areas. And we'll talk about that as well. So uh, start building on AWS. Here are some tips that I'd like to give you for getting started. If you haven't worked with an AWS account uh, thus far, good news, uh, we have something called AWS Free Tier. And the idea behind Free Tier is it helps you gain free hands-on experience working with some of the services we talked about today um, and the various different products and features. Um, in order to create a, a brand new account and utilize free tier, you can go to aws.amazon.com slash free. Uh, that'll detail all the uh, you know, free uh, services within either a 12 month trial period or in some cases actually you know, uh, forever free. So take a look at that uh, site to determine you know, what are some of the services that you can get some hands on with uh, that won't cost you anything to start. Um, what I would recommend uh, for those that are creating a brand new AWS account is to look into what are called billing alarms. And uh, this is really, really helpful for someone who is uh, just starting out with some of these services we talked about. You can go to the billing console in your new AWS account and actually schedule or set up an alarm that will let you know uh, when you're spending over a certain amount. So beyond the free tier, if you decide that you want to use certain services that do incur some charge, um, you can monitor your uh, cost over time uh, using that and also get alerts. You can also use tools. Uh, we have a multitude of developer tools. Uh, you can utilize our command line interface, uh, the SDKs, and a number of other resources there. If you go to aws.amazon.com slash developer, uh, you can see more about the tooling to start. And last, uh, if you want real world examples of architectures from other customers and best practices, you can utilize our quick starts. Go to aws.amazon.com slash quick start uh, to see some real world examples. If you want to continue your learning after uh, this awesome day, you can learn at your own pace uh, by going to the aws.training uh, site. And uh, we've got lots of different uh, self-paced uh, courses, such as the AWS Cloud Practitioner Essentials uh, course. So this way, you can really take your learning further um, after this sort of short session that we had. You can learn from AWS experts. Um, we also have a number of other courses and classroom uh, uh, courses and other digital content where you can learn from, uh, again, you know, AWS experts and instructors like myself um, in the AWS Technical Essentials course. And then finally, uh, after that, if you still want to get a little bit more hands-on and other resources, we've, uh, we've created what are called ramp-up guides. And uh, these basically give you a variety of different resources across a number of different domains we'll talk about in a moment here, um, which can help you uh, gain more real-life uh, you know, experience uh, you know, working with these different services, and then also get prepared to uh, certify in, in, in different areas. So uh, these ramp-up guides, just kind of a quick uh, you know, view as to what these are. 
Um, these are your guides to learning the AWS Cloud. And uh, as you'll see on screen, uh, we have a number of different domains that you can uh, you know, dive into. And we have lots of different resources to learn more um, about maybe developing on AWS, uh, maybe in, within an area like databases or game tech on AWS. We talked about Internet of Things and the machine learning. So if you want to learn more about that, um, we have ramp up guides in each of those areas. So as an example here, uh, let's take a look at one uh, ramp up guide. Uh, we'll kind of spotlight Cloud Practitioner. Um, so for those that are uh, looking for a little bit more information on some of the key services, uh, really want to get started in kind of a broad way, um, uh, Cloud Practitioner is a really great way to uh, you know, understand a little bit more across the different domains that we touched today um, and really get a deeper understanding. So I highly recommend looking at the Cloud Practitioner ramp up guide uh, to go ahead and get started. And last, after looking at all those resources and potentially uh, you know, sitting in another training uh, after today, if you feel like you're ready to validate your expertise, um, we have the AWS certifications. So uh, these are from foundational to associate to professional level with even our specialty certifications as well. And some reasons why you might think about certifying, again, demonstrating your expertise. Um, it's uh, a great way to earn recognition and visibility, um, you know, whether you're currently looking for um, a new job or if you are uh, you know, looking to uh, demonstrate that experience within the company that you're currently working for, a great way to represent your knowledge um, and take that with you. Um, and then finally, uh, something that I would just mention on that, if you are looking to get certified, um, we do have the self-paced lab, and we also have a number of other certification resources that you can find on our website as well. And with that, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us for Awesome Day 2021. Looking forward to seeing you in the next Awesome Day um, or any of our upcoming AWS events. Thank you.